issues. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, well. Yes. It's like yes. Uh, great. Wonderful. Yes. So let, let me then share my screen. Um, so now, now you see the presentation full screen mode, right? Yep. Yeah, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. And let, let me start by thanking Valer for the wonderful opportunity of talking today here. And uh, I would also like to apologize for not being able to be there in person, but it's really thrilling to be here in this session. Uh, so today I'd like to tell you about how we can create topological and nodal superconductors with Van der Waals materials, and in particular, how we can drive materials that are in principle conventional superconductors to this more unconventional regime. And the story I'm going to tell you today is based on two experimental findings that the group of Peter Lidger at Alto University had, and uh, we provided the theoretical support. And of course, there was many people involved in this that I will tell you about. So the background for today's story is uh, the Van der Waals world, the world of two-dimensional materials in which, as you well know, we have many different types of order. So we, have, of course, have some, some metals such as graphene that it's the most well-known one, but we also have insulators, superconductors for electric, semiconductors for magnets, quantum spin hole insulators, multiferroics, and even quantum spin liquid candidates. And the most important idea of these materials is that besides the fundamental interest that each one of these materials has by itself, we can actually also create much more exotic forms of quantum matter by properly combining these materials. And this idea essentially relies on a relatively simple chemical fact of these materials, which are the weak Van der Waals forces which essentially tells us that we can take any two materials from the previous list put them on top of another and combine any electronic orders that, that we want. And in this way, we can combine conventional superconductors with ferromagnets or with topological insulators or with anti-ferromagnets and, and so forth. And what is also very important in these materials is that we cannot only combine different electronic orders, but we can also twist the materials one with respect to each other. And this degree of freedom of twisting the two materials allows us to control what is the different coupling between the two materials, and most importantly, to engineer new electronic states that have a lattice scale associated to this Moiré super lattice. And just as a paradigmatic example of how this idea of combining two-dimensional materials and twisting the angles is very, very powerful, let me emphasize the case of twisted bilayer graphene, the simplest twisted Van der Waals material in which we take two layers of graphene on top of another at a certain angle. And in this material, just depending on very teeny tiny details of your structure, such as the angle that you have or the bias that you apply between the two layers, you can realize a huge plethora of electronic orders. You can get superconductivity, topological networks, different types of topological insulators, correlated insulators, including mod insulators, or charge density waves, quasi-crystal in physics, and even fractional churn insulators. And all this appears just in a twisted by graphene, which is the simplest Van der Waals heterostructure. So if we now look at the previous list of Van der Waals materials, and in particular, we start focusing on superconducting based Van der Waals materials, we can imagine that we will have a huge degree of freedom that perhaps will allow us, allow us to see superconducting states that are very, very challenging to see in other compounds. And that is essentially the idea for the experiment that I would like to tell you today. So today I'm going to talk about two different sets of Van der Waals materials. First, I'm going to tell you how we can create topological superconductivity in chromium bromide niobium diselenite, so in a heterostructure combining two different two-dimensional materials. And second, I would like to tell you how we can take a two-dimensional material that in principle is a conventional superconductor and drive it to the nodal superconducting regime by growing very specific samples. And before going to the physics part, let me emphasize that all the results I'm going to show you today wouldn't be possible without the amazing work of many people. And in particular, you see all the people that are responsible for the experimental work that it's, of course, the most important part, in particular, Somesh, Mohamed, Marcus, Linhao, Williams, Shabulinu, Mohamed, and Peter Lidero, that it's the leader of the Atomic Scale Physics Group at Aldo University. And of course, I would like to also thank Wansay Marian, two PhD students in my group that did the theory support in these findings. So let me start with the first material. So now you would like on top of chromium bromide, and let me tell you how we can see topological superconductivity, and in particular, a topological superconductivity driven 
by the moiré pattern between the two materials. So as a starting point, let me remind you what is the idea of topological superconductivity. So if you think about a superconductor, you essentially have an electronic structure that has a gap that in this gap appears because of the pairing between the different electrons. And we can, of course, have a conventional gapped systems that are topologically trivial, namely that they have a, a gap in the bulk and at the surface. And we can also have topological superconductors that have a gap in the bulk, but that in the surface have gapless excitations, and in particular, excitations that are topologically protected. And these excitations are what are usually called Majorana excitations. And of course, topological superconductors are really, really hard to find in nature. So in the last few years, there have been many, many different strategies to engineer topological superconductivity by combining different materials, including atomic chain semiconductors, different iron-based superconductors, heavy fermion superconductors can natively have topological superconductivity. This can, uh, they can also be engineered with topological insulators. And the story that I would like to tell you today, which is how they can be engineered with two-dimensional materials. So from the fundamental point of view, if we think about any recipe for engineering artificial topological superconductivity, the only thing that we need to know is the following. If you want to have a topological superconductor, you just have to combine two different ingredients. First, a S-wave superconductivity. This is the conventional superconducting order that can come from any conventional superconductor. And second, helical states. And these helical states can appear for many different reasons. They can come from a topological insulator. They can be artificially engineered by combining spin orbit coupling effects and the exchange couplings or magnetic fields and so forth. What is important is that if you combine these two ingredients on the right footing, you can essentially realize an artificial topological superconductor essentially because these two ingredients give rise to the so-called KTF model. And all the previous recipes to engineer artificial topological superconductivity rely on in one way or another in this relatively simple idea. And this is exactly what is the basis for artificial topological superconductivity in this van der Waals heterostructure. So in particular here, we will have a monolayer of chromium bromide on top of naive diselenite. And the breakthrough finding uh, that happened two years ago was the observation of topological superconductivity in this hybrid heterostructure, and in particular, topological superconductivity that was proved by a full gap in the bulk and gapless states on the surface. And here on the right, you see the, the spectroscopy at the surface. But now, two-dimensional materials can be misaligned, right? And that sample where they saw topological superconductivity certainly had a more pattern. So let me tell you a little bit what is the relevance of this more pattern. And for that, let me start with a very simple model, a one-dimensional system with a more pattern. And in, in this one-dimensional system, if we think about in which energy windows we can get topological superconductivity in the absence of a more pattern, we can essentially get topological superconductivity at the very top of the band and at the very bottom of the band. And the reason for this is because at those in those two regions, we essentially have parabolic dispersion. And parabolic dispersion is something that we need to be able to get these helical states. Now, if you start thinking that you take that electronic structure and you add a more pattern, maybe by putting your one-dimensional system on top of another one-dimensional system that it's incommensurate, what will happen is that your bands will get folded and you will develop mini bands. And in particular, these mini bands will have new tops of band and new bottoms of mini band. And this is actually the key point for understanding what is the role of more patterns in topological superconductivity. So if you now look at this uh, folded band structure that has new mini bands driven by the more pattern, and you start thinking about in which parts of your band structure you can get topological superconductivity, what you have is that now you can get topological superconductivity in many other energy windows in your electronic structure. And in particular, you can get topological superconductivity uh, every time that you have a miniband top or a miniband bottom. So if you compare in which regions you can get topological superconductivity without the moiré with the regions in which you can get topological superconductivity with the moiré, what you automatically see is that the moiré pattern essentially increases by a lot the range of energy windows in which you can get topological superconductivity. So this idea alone tells you that more patterns in two-dimensional materials are very likely to help you 
to get topological superconductivity because of this very simple idea. Now, let me show you how this is of relevance to the experiment. Here on the left, you see a topography of the chromium bromide niobium diselenide heterostructure. And what you uh, very clearly see is that there's a more pattern that arises due to the uh, both uh, different lattice constants between the, two par between the two materials and also a relative twist angle. And in the following, I'm going to tell, uh, I'm going to focus on telling you what is the spectroscopy in three different energy windows inside the gap and in the so-called Yushiva-Rusinov bands, which are essentially the bands that give rise to topological superconductivity. So now if you think about the effective Hamiltonian for this system, the simplest thing that you can consider is that the Moore pattern is essentially going to modulate the exchange coupling between the two materials. And in particular, it's going to generate an exchange coupling uh, with uh, a profile that follows the more pattern, which is essentially the picture that you, you see on the left. Now, if you go to the experiment and you look at the location of the Yushiva-Rusinov bands, so these bands that give rise to the topological superconducting state, what you actually see is that those states are perfectly following the more pattern, and in particular, they follow the exchange profile that one would expect that it's going to exist between the two materials. And of course, that modulation of the yushiva of bands is something that one gets automatically in a theoretical calculation with that exchange profile. Now, the most interesting point is that one can see what is the impact of that modulation of the exchange profile in the edge states, in the topological edge states of this material. So here on the, on the left, I'm showing you how the uh, experimental DITB is for the yushiva of bands at an energy that is above the gap, so where you essentially see the bulk states. And what you see is that there's a profile that follows the more pattern. So there's a small modulation. And of course, you also see that in the theoretical calculation. And if you now go to energies inside the topological gap, so energies where you see the topological in-gap states, what you actually observe is that there's a modulation of the edge states that again follows the more pattern which is essentially what you see also in the theoretical calculation. So to sum up, in this chromium bromide and the selenide heterostructure, we see that the Moray pattern clearly modulates the electronic structure. And we know from a theoretical point of view that Moray patterns uh, essentially allows us to get topological superconductivity, or at least increases much more the phase space in which we can get topological superconductivity. So in short, Moray patterns in, in these materials can actually be a very powerful way to drive these systems towards the topological superconducting regime. Now, the second story that I would like to tell you is how we can get a different type of superconducting state in a slightly different material. Now, in another dichalcogenide material that is tantalum disulfide. So the idea for uh, the, sec the second part of the talk is that uh, we can have a different type of unconventional superconducting state, which is a nodal superconducting state, which is, of course, the well-known uh, well superconducting states in high TC superconductors and other types of correlated superconductors. And the basic idea is that if you compare the density of states of a fully gapped superconductor with a nodal superconductor, what you get is that in a fully gapped superconductor, you have a hard gap, so you, you have a U-shaped density of states, whereas in an unconventional superconductor, you have a V-shaped density of states. And we usually consider that V-shaped density of states are essentially driven by some unconventional pairing, pairing glues such as magnons or plasmons or valence fluctuations and so forth. From the point of view of two-dimensional materials, for a long time, it has been considered that uh, two-dimensional dichalcogenides such as even diselenide and tantalum disulfide, they were relatively let's say simple conventional S-wave superconductors driven by electron phonon coupling. In the last few years, we realized that that is actually not the, the whole story. And in the last few years, there have been some very strong experimental signatures that two-dimensional dichalcogenides, especially when driven to the purely monolayer limit, are very close to being correlated superconductors. And in particular, they may show signatures of different types of unconventional superconductivity. And let me emphasize two of these cases. The first case is the case of uh, tantalum disulfide, where uh, some signatures of F-wave superconductivity were found almost 10 years ago. And the second one is a very recent experiment where in a monolayer nib in the selenite, it was observed that legged modes appear close to the super, super conducting gap. And all these two, and these two signatures are essentially a, a 
signature that those materials are close to being correlated superconductors. So in short, the take home message of this part is the following. If you take tantalum disulfide and you create a monolayer that has some sort of disorder, the superconducting state that you will get is a fully gapped superconductor. Whereas if you create a ultra clean monolayer of tantalum disulfide, you get essentially a gapless nodal F wave superconductor. And from the theory point of view, this is actually relatively simple to understand. Uh, and this comes just from the effect of disorder in unconventional superconductors. If you have an s wave superconductor and you start increasing disorder, essentially you do not impact too much the superconducting gap. This is, of course, well known as Anderson's theorem. In, you have an unconventional superconductor, in particular an f wave superconductor. As you increase the disorder, you essentially close the, the gap and eventually you will kill the unconventional superconducting state. So unconventional superconductors are often very, very sensitive to disorder. And from the electronic uh, structure point of view, essentially what uh, we expect is that an S wave superconductor is going to ha have a fully gapped electronic structure, whereas the F wave superconducting state is going to have an electronic structure that has a gap in certain parts of the Brillouin zone and that it's gapless in other parts of the Brillouin zone. And from the point of view of the, uh, let's say, Fermi surface, what we know, what we expect is that. Uh, in the nodal superconducting state, Jose, even when we have superconductivity, yeah. Questions in two minutes. All right, thanks. Thanks for the note. Um, in the nodal superconducting state, there are some parts of the Fermi surface that are going to remain gapless. All right, so now let me show you how the experimental spectroscopy looks like in these materials. In the dirty sample we get a U-shaped density of states that we can very well fit with a conventional BCS formula for an S-wave superconductor. And if we now go to the ultra clean limit, we get a V-shaped density of states that now we can very well fit with an F-wave superconducting order and with a nodal superconducting order in particular. And what is even more interesting is that if we look at the ultra clean sample at energy very close to the, to the gap, we see that there are some inelastic excitations with a very well-defined, uh, let's say, wavelength that we believe are uh, a signature of the underlying pairing glue of this unconventional superconducting order. And let me emphasize that this is very similar to the pi pi excitations in high TC superconductors that are uh, associated to the anti-ferromagnetic state. And the last signature of unconventional superconducting order is that if we take the ultra clean sample and we apply very large magnetic fields, we essentially open a pseudo gap in the electronic structure. So this is a pseudo gap that gets enhanced by the magnetic field. That it's also very similar to the phenomenology in some correlated superconductors. So this is everything that I wanted to tell you today. So if I can ask you to remember something, please remember that Van der Waals materials offer a platform to realize topological and nodal superconductivity. And uh, with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and look forward to your questions. Do we have any questions from the audience? Um, perhaps the reason why there is no question is that uh, your results are really new, uh, and uh, uh, I propose that the shift from uh, um, the single band upper model to manipulating uh, lattice symmetry and lattice uh, geometry of standard superconductor, and uh, this is really a fantastic uh, result. My best wishes for your career. <laughs> yeah, well, th thank you so much for your uh, very nice feedback. So I will ask a question. Uh, what do we learn? I mean, okay, so we can do, uh, your talk was a little bit quick. <laughs> and uh, so we can do uh, topological and nodal superconductivity with Van der Waals materials, but did we learn something new from your experiments? So we, w what we did learn is that uh, two-dimensional superconductors that were usually considered to be conventional can be driven to the unconventional regime. And in particular, that we can use all these knobs of uh, let's say using different magnetic substrates to drive conventional superconductors to unconventional regimes. And of course, what we would what would be very interesting in the future is to try to get to superconducting regimes that we do not see in, in bulk compounds. 
uh, which is, of course, some of the things that we are trying right now. So what is your definition of unconventional superconductor? So anything that is not S-wave. So that, that is, of course, one specific definition. I, uh, there are, of course, others. OK, thank you for the very nice talk. And uh, let's thank our speaker again. Yeah. yeah, thanks a lot for the opportunity. We come back at 11.30. There's a break now. <laughs>